Well, hello everyone and welcome to this month's story time. I did a story time, I believe it was last month, maybe it was the month before. It was all about why I hate my Tesla and what happened there. And I had so much fun and the reaction was so good that I've decided to make this a monthly event. Today's story time is about when I had a stalker. I'm going to be doing my makeup as I tell the story. It just gives me something else to do instead of just staring at you, which gets kind of boring. And if you're interested for some reason in any of those details, be sure to check the description box, which I think it just says more next to whatever verbiage I put at the top. This is going to cover some stuff that includes stalking, gun ownership, police interaction. If any of those topics should bother you in an extreme way, this is your signal to click out. I had a stalker in the summer of 2002. Yes, it was 20 years ago, and we're gonna have to set the stage a little bit. My husband traveled a ton for work at the time, so he would travel from here usually to the West Coast and then do stuff on the East Coast as well and would often be gone Sunday night through Thursday night or Monday through Friday basically around for the weekend. I also at the time had two boys, still have two boys, they're just 20 years older. I had a one-year-old and a four-year-old, crazy. And that is also pertinent to this story. So 2002 was the year we bought the house that I am sitting in right now. And when we bought this house from the builder, it was called a spec. So they built it on spec. This was a new housing community. They didn't have an owner in mind. They just kind of put together a, a random house and thought it would be attractive to someone, and it was us. So we bought this house in April of 2002. And at the time, this was a brand new construction neighborhood. So very few people were living in the neighborhood. And on my street, we were the only people occupying a house. So because the house was built for spec, there were things that weren't done, left open, so that new owners could make changes and whatever. And one of those things was, we didn't have any kind of deck, patio, nothing in the backyard. Nice big backyard, just grass. So we decided to add a deck. To this day, I cannot figure out how we found the decking company, and the decking company's fine. I don't think they're still in business, but this isn't anything against them. You have to remember, this is before the internet really took off. This is before you could just Google everybody and get all the info. And the deck company sends out a crew with a foreman. And they give the foreman my name, my home number, my cell phone number, and obviously they have my address, so they know where to go. And that's all well and good. And you know, he would use that number occasionally throughout the project to let us know they're on their way or they're leaving for lunch or you know, things like that. I also need to point out that this was the summer, summer 2002, and I live in Texas, San Antonio to be exact, and it gets really, really hot here in the summer. And the deck crew was working in direct sunlight. It was really, really hot. And so I thought I was being friendly. Ladies, don't, don't do this. So I would go out and bring them water, ice water, lemonade, you know, that kind of thing, because I felt badly that they were working in the heat. Don't do that. I think that's what led to this. I also want to add all the products I'm using, except for maybe two, our drugstore. So check the description box. So, you know, kind of got to know in a very superficial way, the crew, specifically the foreman, who we will call the stalker. And at some point he had come to the front door to ask me some questions about something. And he noticed the mezuzah that's on our doorpost. I am Jewish, our family is Jewish. And one of the customs that most Jewish families do is they put what's called a mezuzah on their doorpost. It is a long explanation as to what it really is. It has scripture in it on a scroll, it's rolled up and it is put inside a decorative case and nailed to your doorpost. It's just one of those customs that Jewish families do, pretty common. But if you're not Jewish and you haven't been around Jewish people, you may not know what it is. And in this case, the stalker did not know what it was. And so he asked, he was very polite, and I explained basically what I just told to all of you. Job's done, everything's great. Deck turned out great, by the way. The next thing I know, the stalker starts calling my cell phone and starts leaving messages, very inappropriate messages, things like basically anti-Semitic messages, which is disturbing enough, 
a lot of things about how the Jews have done him wrong. We've wronged him. It was a lot of that. The usual stereotypical tropes that anti-Semites love to say over and over. You know, we run the world. We own the banks. I'm like, really? Like, I don't, like, where did I miss out? Like, where's my bank? I'm being facetious. I immediately called the debt company and said, this is very disturbing and inappropriate. And they called him in, I think, and talked to him. And this part is hazy because honestly, it's been 20 years. I think we may have ended up filing a police report. You have to remember this was at the time, not quite a year after September 11th, 2001. So everyone was just really on edge to begin with. And then he started leaving us messages that saying he's gonna come to the house. He was very still into the anti-Semitic stuff, but at the same time was also twisting it a little to say that he needs to take me away from my Jewish husband because I belong with him. And while he was doing all those things and saying all those things, they were very scary, obviously, but he never crossed the line into a full-on crime. Like he never said the words you need to hear to make it a true hate crime or a true threat. And you should know, if you guys are watching me and you don't know my family, my husband at this point was in corporate law, but at the beginning of his career, he was actually a criminal prosecutor. He was a special assistant U.S. attorney and criminal prosecutor. And so, you know, he was pretty well aware, not so much of local Texas law, but generally like what the requirements of the law are to get something to escalate to, you know, like a formal charge or something. I can't remember when the actual police report, initial police report got filed, but at some point he called and basically insinuated that he was on his way to get me and get the kids. So I called 911, as you do. Now remember, this is a brand new development. Google Maps wasn't a thing yet. So it took the police 26 minutes to get to my house. This is not a slight on SAPD at all. The nearest substation from our house was over nine miles away. This is, if it's gonna be a slam against anyone, it's gonna be the city planning who vote to approve of hundreds and thousands of homes to be built in a neighborhood or an area of town that doesn't have the infrastructure to support it, like fire and police. I had to teach my four-year-old son to take our one-year-old son and find a way to hide in our closet and to stay quiet until mommy said it was okay to come out because I was very worried that he would try to come to the front of the house. I didn't want the kids to see or hear anything that would scare them. Imagine having that conversation with a child and trying to tell them in a way that isn't gonna scare them and make it seem like a game, which is what I tried to do. So the police finally come. They're super nice, very apologetic. They got the wrong directions on, I think back in the day they had the actual map books and they, so this area, the street didn't exist on any maps yet. and. Obviously, you know, they checked the perimeter. They asked to come in the house just to double check. Michael was out of town. That's my husband at the time, which makes this even worse. Everything's great. And I said, well, this is all well and good that he's not here. But like, what am I supposed to do if this happens again? If he's really here, the worst could happen before you guys show up. The detective looked me straight in the eye and he said, you need to get a gun. Now, if this upsets you to hear this, I'm not here to debate the merits of gun ownership or gun control all, and all that. I'm saying that when you are put in the very real position of a possibility of a psychopath coming to your home and threatening to hurt you and your kids, even if you've been very much anti-gun, your views start changing real quickly. Just wanted to put that in there because that was a big turning point for me. I was 29 years old at the time and so I was forced to think about things I had never really had to face, only theoretically, so that was interesting. Good thing is, guy never wasn't there. Oh, it's all good. He did it a second time. This time the police came out within nine minutes, which was great. Still no proof that he was ever on our property, which is all good. I mean, threats are scary, but actual physical presence would have been horrible. Okay. Also, I should add, We'd been keeping the deck company apprised of everything that was going on. They fired him. And they also gave us all of his employee information, like social security number, address, all the things so that we could file a very in-depth police report. 
But remember, again, he didn't actually do anything that could get him to be charged. And at one point in this saga, I do remember that I went down to the San Antonio Police Department to file the police report, the first one. And at the time, and it's been 20 years, so I don't know if it's different now. At the time, there was like all violent crimes, all crimes against people fell under the homicide department. <laughs> so I had to go and fill out all this information in the homicide department downtown, which is like, wait, are you telling me that I'm filing this just in case it escalates? Do you have the paperwork to start a homicide? I mean, like assault, um, sexual assault, homicide, battery, all those things, that's part of violent crimes, which is part of homicide, and then everything else is a property crime. I don't know if they've changed that, but it's very um, off-putting when you see yourself walking into the homicide department. But the police officers, and the detectives, I guess, at this level, were incredibly nice. I had all the information. I had a social security number and his address and his full name, and I think a photocopy of his driver's license to give them, and they were able to run him in the system. And this is interesting. This can, this could, start a whole debate on victims' rights versus the rights of the accused, and we're not gonna do that, because I can argue both sides pretty effectively, but um, remember, this guy's just accused. He's not been actually charged, and he certainly hasn't been convicted, and so they pull him up in the computer, and all of a sudden, the printer starts printing out pages after pages after pages, and I was like, oh my God, who is this guy? And he goes, the detective was like, well, he was never actually convicted of anything. So none of this is public record, so I can't tell you. And then he says, but I have to go to the bathroom. I will be right back. And he leaves with the printout just sitting there, obviously, right there. So of course I took a really quick look and this guy had been, uh, many, many people had filed complaints against this guy for assault, for stalking, for threat, and all those things. But the charges never were filed, the witnesses withdrew statements, or they just never followed through. So there was no actual full-on charge. Sometimes there were charges, there was no convictions. I forgot something kind of interesting and weird about this whole thing. I remember saying to the initial police officers that came the first time, I don't have a gun, what am I supposed to do if he shows up and it takes you guys 20 minutes again to get here and he's like through the door. And they said, do you have a baseball bat? And I said, well, yeah. And they said, you know, keep the baseball bat by the door, but when you swing, don't aim for his head. Aim for his collarbone. Because if you aim for his head and he ducks, you'll miss, you'll overcorrect, you'll throw yourself off your balance and he can get you. If he you aim for his collarbone and he ducks, you're gonna slam him right in the head and incapacitate him. And if he doesn't duck, you're still gonna slam him in his collarbone and probably break it and he probably won't be able to grab, he won't be able to use one of his arms. I'm like, nice, thank you for that self-defense lesson. Anyway, like I said, they were doing their best. Like, they were really, I really, anyway, they tried. Somehow it all kinds of dies down. Now fast forward, it's, I think it's September, and now it's the Jewish high holidays, specifically Yom Kippur, which is our most holy of holidays. It's the day of atonement. We spend all day in the synagogue. We fast, we ask God for forgiveness for all our sins for the previous year. It's a big day. We're getting, it's a Sunday. We're getting ready to go to services when the doorbell rings and it's the United States Postal Service. It's a Sunday. I don't know again if things have changed, but back then, if you wanted a specific Sunday delivery, you had to say you wanted it, pay extra, and they would deliver on Sundays. So this psychopath sent us, I don't even know how many pages. It is out of a serial killer's playbook. I have a photocopy of some of it, and I will do a close-up, but it's pages and pages of creepy font, and then also handwriting, and it just goes on and on and on. The mailman hands us the envelope, and as I'm like already like, this is weird, why are we getting a letter on a Sunday? Stalker 101, if you're gonna send someone something crazy in the mail, don't put your return address on it. The stalker put his actual return address on the envelope, I can laugh about this now, it's 20 years later and clearly we're all okay. I recognized his address from all the reports I'd had to file, all the paperwork. So I was like, whoa. And if I'm remembering correctly, this all was happening very much around the time when Congress and other political officials were receiving those envelopes in the mail that people thought had, maybe it did, I can't even remember, had ricin in it, like a poisonous nerve agent. So we were like, whoa, what did he put in the envelope? You know, it was like kind of a bigger, thicker. I told the postal guy, I don't want this. 
And there's like, I'll just, I told him kind of what was going on. I'm like, we're refused service. And he's like, well, I don't want it. So he's I like, you need to leave it outside. So he left it on our front doorstep. We called 911, which included like a bomb squad. Cause we didn't, nobody knew. It's not funny. I think I'm laughing cause it's like, I cannot believe this actually happened. This is so insane. So the police show up really fast this time, like really fast. And this part, I could not believe they did. They opened the letter. I'm like, you're opening it out in the street, like not in my house. And it was just that letter that I showed you. So no creepy powder, no bomb, thank God. But now he's crossed a line because in the letter, I'll read you some of it in a second when I'm not doing my mascara. There was a lot of references to Judaism and, and a lot of anti-Semitic stuff, as well as allusion, alluding to taking me away from my family and erasing my existing family. But again, it's almost like he absolutely knew what he was doing because as disturbing as all that was, none of it was enough of a direct threat, at least the threshold at that time. Laws may have changed and the statutes may have changed and what's required to prove that it's a hate crime or something like that may have changed since 2002. There really wasn't a lot they could do. They couldn't formally charge him at the time with a hate crime or with a threat or any of those things. We filed the report, obviously. I did have to submit a records request to get it back because I did want a copy of it. I don't know why. Who knew I was gonna make a video about it 20 years later? What they did do though, was they could call him in for questioning. And so I don't know if this was done on purpose, but it turned out that they got a detective who was younger with blonde hair, a woman, to be the person that he spoke to. And he basically switched his fascination and fixation with me to her. And it all just came to a stop within, I'd say, about a month. It took me a little bit longer than that to stop looking over my shoulder and to sleep at night. I know the police had given us a whole lot of advice on things like if you go and do the same routine, like at the time I was taking my four-year-old to preschool Monday through Friday, obviously driving the same way. And they were like, you need to go different routes and you need to let the preschool know. And luckily our preschool has armed guards. So I feel like my kids were safer. My young, my older son was safer there. And, you know, my husband tried to move his uh, trial schedule around. It's a little hard when you're in federal court to move dockets, but um, everyone was really accommodating. And it just kind of faded away. I know that is a very anticlimactic end to this stalker story, but that's real life. Like that's sometimes how it, and more often than not, how it goes. It doesn't end with a dramatic, horrible death, thank God. It doesn't end with a really interesting court case. It just kind of faded away. Let me put on some lipstick and I'll read you a little bit on that letter. By the way, if you are ever needing to write to your local authority, law enforcement authorities on how to request records, I will say, this is what my husband, the attorney told me to write. I am requesting any and all information relating to case number blah, blah, blah under the Texas Open Records Act. Please send the information to the above address or contact me by phone at blah, blah, blah. Thank you sincerely, Marnie Goldberg and I. We had to fax, this was back when faxing was the only way to send things in. He was referencing my maiden name. I don't know how he found that back in the day. I think I had Facebook back then. So maybe that I don't even know. But um, he would refer to me by my maiden name and my husband, obviously by his name, insinuating that we were not married. I'll try to read you some of this. He starts at the very top in handwriting. It says, this is not a threat. Marnie, please read Revelations. They are talking to you and me, no one else. And then he also titles it, says, this is a page for my book, registered copyright, pending publication. Kind of trying to say this is fiction. This isn't really me talking to you. And he said, this is the way things are. I did not make them this way and it is not my fault. These things are of a spiritual nature and I am so tired of people. We are yin and yang. We are Adam and Eve. We are the Joseph and Mary. We are soulmates. I am the boy in the bubble. I am Mexico. What comes to you in visions and dreams. I am he who comes to you dressed in white, in the blackness of night. Kind of goes on and on and on. This is the part that started getting more freaky. Um, we are still interrupted by the pervert who gave you two children. Tell that pervert and your friends, I said, don't touch you anymore. And he better give you this letter. In my jealous rage, I will start sending people to hell. 
Remember your broken vows, repent, and I will be merciful unto you and your children. So like he never just says, I'm going to come over and kill you. That would have been something we could have taken action on. I'm not going to keep reading this because it gets really dark and gross and, and it, I can feel my heart starting to beat a little faster. So what takeaways do I have to give you from all of this? I mean, it's a bit of a cautionary tale. I think this was so bizarre and random that I don't even know how to explain to you what you should take from this. Um, I think it's a pretty rare situation that you have to sit and think of escape routes from your own home or that you have to practice safety drills with your children where mommy says go like a hide and seek game and I'm gonna tell you to go hide and then you have to hide so well that no one can find you and no one can hear you till mommy says the magic word. Yes, we practice that a lot. Or that you should lay in bed and visualize how you're gonna get your kids hidden and then shoot and kill this guy so that they don't see it, hear it, and that also that you keep your carpets clean. That was the weird stuff that was going through my head at that time. It's weird what your brain decides to prioritize and making sure that if I shot and killed this guy in my house that his blood didn't get on my carpet at that moment was a priority for me. I hope this didn't upset you too much. It is a very bizarre story, which is why I thought it'd be interesting to share. And it happened a long time ago and everybody is fine. I do not know what happened to this guy. Last I heard, I think he had left the state. So that is good. And he was 56 at the time. So now he's in his mid late seventies. It just, I don't think about it all that much. I will be doing story time every single month. So if you enjoyed this, Maybe that's the wrong word, but if you got something out of this, they're not all gonna be this horrific. I do already have a topic for next month, but don't wait that long. Please make sure that you subscribe. I will go back to my usual everyday stuff, like talking about fashion stuff, a little bit of makeup and some home decor, and then we'll have another story time towards the end of September. Thanks for hanging out with me today. I hope you got something out of this, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.